Hey, it's Christian with Collision Hub, and we're back on the episode of Repair University to talk a little bit more about rivet, rivet bondings, and procedures. Now, Larry and I have moved on to talk about a little bit more the actual collision repair process with rivets. Tell me what we're looking at here, Larry. There's, there's a lot to look at. I mean, we, we went over some out-of-body repa panel repair in one of our other series. Uh, we also went over uh, rivets. I brought a couple extra here now. And well, we got lucky today. I know it's very difficult to get all these videos set up the right way without paying or having somebody donate stuff to us. Well, Carolina has this uh, uh, at their booth today at NACE 2014 from BMW, loaned it to them. Also, over at the iCar booth, they also have one that's been repaired. So we're going to be able to do a comparison between the two. Uh, what they did was is they replaced this upper strut assembly or apron assembly on that particular I-3 and they also sectioned in the front rail. So we're going to be able to see the glue, we're going to be able to see the rivets and where the application is. And on that particular vehicle, when they go to replace this upper tower, there's going to be a bunch of drill holes and they're going to be able to put the rivets in and they're using these monobolt type rivets which are structural, they make that compression there and you would utilize, utilize a tool such as this which would come up and you put the rivets in and squeeze them in and this works with a uh, pneumatic type thing so uh, real quick while we're here we do have this vehicle secured down at its four jacking points in addition to that they have this Evo system which is locking in the three towers in the front so when you go to change this uh, front rail let's say we're going to change this apron we'd have another Evo over here bolted directly to the top and where we cut this here so now we have the Upper, uh, the uh, upper strut tower would be reaffixed with rivets here and adhesive, be held in place with the Evo and checked with the Carolina measuring. But when we section this front rail in this area here, we'd be able to put this back on and hold it with this Evo and still measure the front along with the Carolina measuring system. After you're done installing the rivets, the glue needs a certain amount of dry time based on the manufacturer of the glue, how long it's going to have to stay in this fixture jig or universal fixture system, they call it Evo, to be able to cure properly. If the vehicle, if the uh, machine has wheels on it, you can roll it into the booth, you can bake it and accelerate it, but you're looking at sometimes four to eight hours, even 24 hours in some cases. Wow. So this is important to understand and read the repair manual or the repair information from each manufacturer. Right. So my bench system and the way I'm holding it is even taking more of a play in the process of the repair that I'm gonna be doing. You'll see more and more that uh, we use a lot of a lot of people, insurance and body shop, are using old technology of X amount of time to set a car up and then a lot of pull time. What you're going to start seeing is um, a certain amount of time to set the vehicle up and then adding additional anchors at different locations huh. and getting it more to the point that you're going to have uh, um, dry times or cure times on these machines or, or frame tie up because of that, because the car's gonna be sitting on the machine, you can't pull it off because it's gotta sit until the material cures. And each material is different based on the ambient temperature and the process of which it's being used. That's great. Well, I can't wait to see this one get repaired. So we're gonna walk over and take a look at what would it be like if maybe I was gonna to have to put on section on a rail, do the upper apron, something that may be a common repair procedure in your shop and how rivets play a role in that. And we'll walk over to iCar and take a look at the sample that they've given us here at SEMA. That'll be great. Let's take it out. Okay. Hey, we're back at Repair University now. We've made our way over to the actual repair sample in the iCar booth to talk a little bit more about the rivet bonding procedure. And the old tech in me is seeing this and it kind of hurts a little bit. This is definitely not an undetectable repair process that I'm seeing. Oh no, it's not, but it's manufacturer approved, so it's okay that it's being done this way. And you're going to see the repair on a lot of these vehicles. The big thing that engineers look for when they when they make these repair procedures is that the vehicle's safe and will will react in the manner in which it was designed to in a subsequent collision event. So in this case, what we're seeing on this vehicle, which was, uh, this is here for iCar that was put together by uh, BMW, this is their procedures, their way of doing it, and what they've already done through research and development and, and obviously uh, uh, CAG crashes and actual crashes to make sure this vehicle is going to react the same, not to change the crash impulse to alter the airbag timing or even the crushability uh, or the crash management of the vehicle. So talk a little bit about, walk us through a little bit about the repair. I see the glue and I see the rivets. Um, what's the process here for a repair? Well, <clears throat> I didn't get a chance to look at their actual repair procedure, but I can tell you by looking <laughs> at it what they have here. Obviously they have some sort of a replacement procedure for this upper bracket 
for the apron assembly, and obviously they have a, a replace, replacement procedure for the apron assembly, and even a sectioning procedure, as you can see here, for replacing a portion of the front of the rail without going too deep into the vehicle. Because as you can see on this front structure, which is um, extrusions, uh, uh, basically on, on most of it, uh, this is a cast part, they're welded to this. So they're trying to avoid welding, uh, in most likely. Right. So they want to be able to sell portions of it to be able to replace it and section it without going too deep into the vehicle. Now, we did see SPRs before of a couple of different sizes, and we do have these model bolts or these compression-type structural rivets. You're never going to see an SPR on something thick. That's for outer body to inner structure portions or outer body panel to uh, uh, an inner, uh, inner uh, uh, reinforcement or something. That's going to be thin. 0.9 millimeter, one millimeter, something to that effect. This thick stuff, you can't put an SPR, so you're gonna have to use something different, and that's why they have these type of monobolt rivets. In this particular case, we can see a sectioning cut line here that they put in, and this plate's covering, obviously, the line across the top. These, rivet ho these rivets, uh, obviously, we had to drill all the way through all the components. So basically on this, it's, it's showing me a grouping of rivets and some spacing of rivets. That's based on where BMW wanted you to drill these rivets. In some cases, not sure with this vehicle, I didn't get a chance to look at these repair procedures. Um, they might have a diagram for you that where these, rivet, where these rivet holes have to actually go. So what you would do is you would get the proper rivets from the manufacturer. And once again, these are Mercedes-Benz, so I don't know if these are the right ones, but I'm just using this as an example. You would place them in to be able to compress these rivets down. In this case, you'd make sure they're the right size rivets, and before you put any of your glue in there, you'd make sure it fits in the hole. You'd have to deburr the hole, uh, clean it up, clean the backside, and they want you to use a lot of glue. All rivet bond procedures want lots and lots of glue, and when you squeeze it together, they want a lot of glue to spit out, and then you can go ahead and clean it and wipe it down afterwards. So I would go ahead and count out my rivets, make sure I have the right amount. In every other hole, I'll have a Clico to hold it in place. Some of them are a double slide with a little screw down, some are kind of like a little uh, clip-in type, and it'll hold that area. Now the big thing that technicians have to realize is every time you put a rivet in and I squeeze it with the gun, you're going to get glue that's going to spit out around here. That basically encapsulates the rivet to prevent it from causing rust or anything else. The thing is, is that you get it on your gun, and every third rivet is a good practice, is wipe off with some sort of uh, chemical to clean off the glue and that the area is clean. And then you would go ahead and continue on with your rivets as you squeeze them in there, making sure you keep the gun clean, because if it dries on the gun, it's not gonna operate properly. And these guns are not really cheap. And the components for them aren't cheap either, so you don't wanna break anything at all with these. So we can see here the backside of these rivets here, what they look like, we see I told you they form a, a collar. Yeah. So that locks it in place. And, and then we have the rivets going from one side and from the other side. So it's important to understand how you're going to put this back together. Obviously it being some sort of fixture jig system to ensure that there's no movement. And they make these tools that have these movable heads, as you can see, so it can move around and make it easier to get into certain tight, cramped areas. Perfect. Now, when we were talking about the rivets and the glue, is that proprietary to each manufacturer? So is that something that the shop's going to have to order from the OEM and make sure that they have the right product? Uh, generally, you're going to have to order from the manufacturer. The repair information, such as Benz, Audi, Porsche, is going to tell you the rivet number, the size of the rivet, and then you'd order that from the dealership. I, I would assume that someplace you go back far enough, there's one manufacturer Germany or America who's making a lot of these rivets stamping different things on the heads, but each one's required to be a different length, a different diameter, uh, a, a different strength. So you just can't pick up any old rivet and just grab it. You have to know what rivet they want. For example, you might have a, a, a specially coated steel rivet. You might have a boron alloy rivet that's specially coated. You might have an aluminum rivet in some cases. So you really got to know what the manufacturer wants. And they're going to tell you the proprietary glue the proprietary uh, type rivet they want to utilize also. The tools though, like that particular um, tool that we got from Reliable, that one fits across two or three different manufacturers with interchangeable heads. Some are just standard, like the hand rub that we saw uh, earlier in one of our other videos, that one's for the new Ford program. So you really have to know what company wants what, and unfortunately if you're on a bunch of OEM certified programs, you might have four and five rivet guns, like we've talked before yeah. about having four or five aluminum welders. It can get very, very expensive. Right. 
Well, that's a lot of information. I know that's going to take me a little while to get used to. And I'm, I'm, I'm it's not pretty, but it works. I am old school, <laughs> but I can see how the technology and the metals and, the, and all of that is changing the way not only are we repairing the cars, but the new skill sets the technicians are going to have to have. So stay tuned to Repair University as we bring you more training live from the SEMA Show 2014 as we get into more repair technology and more of the tools and equipment you're going to need in 2015 to keep your collision repair shop going. Thanks.